you all for being here with us. We are, as you know, working through our survey of the life of King David. This is the first time this morning we're going to see a little bit of the darker angels in David's career uh, showing up, and so this will be a nice bit of perspective on a guy that so far has been pretty heroic, you know. Last week we saw David make this amazing appeal to Saul, who was out to get him, malicious intent, and David gives an articulate and wonderful and persuasive speech that actually reaches the heart of Saul and seems to ameliorate things a little bit for a while. But today we see almost a role reversal. Now it's David who has the malicious intent. Rather than giving the speech, he receives the speech. Rather than being the one who is trying to settle things down, he's the one who's being settled down by a speech given not by a great diplomat or politician or someone trained in the arts of rhetoric, but a woman. And she gives one of the most amazing and persuasive presentations found anywhere in the Bible. And her name is Abigail. And so we're going to be highlighting this remarkable moment in which David confronts Abigail. This is chapter 25 of 1 Samuel. We're only going to cover one chapter today, so a little bit more of a modest effort. But I want to give a little more time to this particular story because of how much I think it teaches all of us at a very practical level some of the lessons that she herself incorporated in her confrontation with David. So, we're in 1 Samuel chapter 25, beginning at verse 1, the Word of God. Now Samuel died, and all Israel assembled and mourned for him. They buried him at his home in Ramah. Then David got up and went down to the wilderness of Paran. There was a man in Maon whose property was in Carmel. The man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. He was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the name of the man was Nabal. The name of his wife, Abigail. The woman was intelligent and beautiful, but the man was surly and mean. He was a Calebite. So we'll read the entire chapter before we're done, but let's stop here and ask God's blessing on our consideration of this text. Father, we're grateful for the humanity of this man, David. We're grateful because it gives us encouragement as well, that the grace that was at work in his life had to overcome obstacles just as it does in ours. And we give you thanks that we can learn lessons from a moment just as this one. So we pray that you would enlighten our eyes and open our ears to hear your truth for us from this text, asking all of this in the name of Christ. Amen. So, Samuel died, this remarkable and highly influential character for whom two books are named, and yet he dies halfway through the first one, you know. But in his honor, we continue to denominate the story under the rubric of Samuel. And so this man now passes from the scene. The Israelites mourned him. Probably the custom was for 30 days of mourning for this most important character. About the same time, we hear that David arose and went down to the wilderness that's called here the wilderness of Paran. The death of Samuel, we're told by Josephus, was 18 years into the 40-year reign of Saul, so making it just about halfway through. If you travel in that region and go to the region that is called uh, uh, Ramah, where Samuel lived, you'll find this particular shrine, really, in memory of him. It's his supposed burial place. It may very well be. There's a obituary there. It's fairly brief, but rather weighty. It says that Moses had given the law, but Samuel established the schools of the prophets. We've mentioned that before. The sons of the prophets or the schools of the prophets continued centuries into the future, and by all accounts it was established by Samuel, and David himself apparently was a student at that school. 
where he got the substance of his education. We also hear that he united the squabbling tribes into a more united nation that could finally rally around a king. He was a force for uniting these, these disparate tribes who in many cases were attacking each other. The book of Judges gives us some evidence of that. You know, in our own American history, before we had the Constitution, we had what are called the Articles of Confederation, which was really a very loose association. People didn't say they belonged to the United States, they said they belonged to Virginia, or they are a Rhode Islander, or a New Yorker. The people identified themselves by their tribe, by their state, by their colony, but it was really after the Constitution that we formed a more perfect union, as the preamble says. In some ways, that was the impact that Samuel had as well. He began to help these people see themselves as a more cohesive political body rather than these various tribes here and there throughout the region. One said it would be hard to imagine a more strategic character whose legacy has a lasting tribute here in this particular location. Well, about the same time, maybe not necessarily related to that event, but about that time, David moves south. He goes to a place that's called in the text the Wilderness of Paran. Some such location may be out there, but the Septuagint version actually renders that the Wilderness of Maon, and that is a known location, and that seems more probable to be the place where David wound up. So he was, we saw last week, in Engedi. He goes south, still on the west side of the Dead Sea to this region that is a little bit further away from the action. And apparently, at this time, given what had happened last week and his appeal to Saul and the positive response from Saul, we get a feeling that things settle down and that David is not now quite as harried as he has been, and this does seem to be a little bit more of a quieter region where he can hang out, you might say, a somewhat less molested than he had been in his earlier experiences. Now we hear that there was a man there in Maon whose business was in Carmel. The man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and it was the season of shearing. Carmel is north of the Maon wilderness. It's south of Ziph, north of the other area. That seems to be where David now settles for a time with those who are traveling with him, several hundred people. This character we encounter is said to be rich. The riches, the wealth is based largely on livestock. And so he has thousands of head of various kinds of livestock, as we just heard, and it happens to be the time of shearing. This is something like harvest. It's a time in which now the fruit of your labor is going to be collected, and it's going to be a time of considerable revenue. And he, of course, is gathering in through this shearing process wool, which had a huge positive uh, value and uh, was part of where his wealth came from. Will was considered so important not only for clothing but for a variety of other purposes that it was actually regarded as a gift from God and thus this was a very important moment for him in a time of some festivity. So it was expected at this time, kind of like a holiday season, that owners of sheep and the shearing process would give rise to a kind of levity, a sort of generosity, a kind of open-handed willingness to be generous and to meet the needs of others, and that's the general setting, kind of the mood of the story as it unfolds. <clears throat> we already saw that the man's name was Nabal, his wife's name Abigail. We're told that she was a woman of good understanding, beautiful countenance, he, on the other hand, probably the husband in an arranged marriage, which was the most common way in which marriages were transacted then, was harsh and evil in his doings, but he was of the house of Caleb. So Nabal, the, the, word, the, the Hebrew word literally means flat or vapid. So you don't know what mood his parents were in the day he was born. Or some have thought maybe it was a nickname that was intended to match his character. But one way or another, that's the name that seems to have stuck, and so that's the name by which he goes. Abigail, on the other hand, 
is a word that means one who gives joy. I was thinking about this preparing. I've met quite a few Abigails in my life, including one of my granddaughters. Uh, I've never met an Abigail that wasn't delightful. I think there is something to that name, isn't it? How many Abigails are there in here? Any? No? Okay, well, uh, just think about that. The Abigails in the world do seem to be lovely people, and she was no exception. We hear that that uh, Nabal was of the house of Caleb. Now that's just a little throwaway comment it seems, but it has some weight. Because Caleb was a famous person. He was regarded as a great hero in the history of Israel. He was one of the two spies who had brought a positive report, and for that he was richly blessed by God. And to be of the house of Caleb was a way of kind of being quasi-nobility in ancient Israel. Now we feel like with this particular man, Nabal, maybe it took a wrong direction. He was too pumped up, too uh, sort of puffed up, you know, with his own importance. That does seem to come through a little bit. But anyway, he had that family association and it seems to have some bearing on the way that he conducted himself here, although in a kind of inverse form. Well, David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep So David sent 10 young men, and David said to the young men, go to Carmel, go to Nabal, greet him in my name. Now David is asking for a gratuity, for services rendered but not requested. So the problem that Nabal had was with all of those thousands of head of livestock, to graze them you had to send them out pretty far afield. And that was just one of the occupational hazards of the day. You couldn't keep them all underfoot. You had to send them out where there was sufficient grazing land. And that always meant that there was a certain degree of peril in so doing, because this was a time when law enforcement was not necessarily consistently enforced, in which we have raiding parties, Philistine raiding parties were not uncommon, the Amalekites would come up from the south, others would come swooping in, sort of almost in a kind of uh, criminal behavior, grabbing a few sheep here and there, grabbing a few goats, making off into the wilderness, and it almost became a line item in your budget, you see. There's going to be a certain amount of loss that's just part of the, you know, the cost of doing business. It's just the way it is. You're not going to lose everything, but you're going to have to at least deal with some of that as you go along. David himself could have been one of those raiders. He was reputed to be, by official public sources, a criminal, a fugitive. He was living out there on the land. He's the kind of guy you might have thought, if you believe what was in the press, that he would come swooping in and grab a few animals to feed the mouths that were depending on him. So he could have been one of the bad guys here, against whom Nabal was going to protect himself or try to. But as it turns out, David is just the opposite. David actually, rather than being a raider, or rather than being indifferent to the situation, actually volunteers to go and provide protection. Now the cynics would say, therefore David is asking for protection money. And uh, that doesn't have necessarily a very positive ring, but it uh, is something like that. David is offering his services, although uninvited. He did provide this great benefit. He saved Nabal some money, certainly. He gave the men who were responsible for tending these sheep a kind of peace and security in the setting that they wouldn't have otherwise had. And so there was some value to what David had provided here. And on that basis, now David makes his request. And the request is formulated in the following short speech. Thus you shall say to him who lives in prosperity, Shalom, peace be to you, peace to your house, peace to all that you have. Now I've heard that you have shearers. Your shepherds were with us. We didn't hurt them. We weren't one of those raiding parties. We didn't hurt them. Nor was anything missing from them. All the while they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, they'll tell you. Therefore let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we've come on a feast day, this festival time of shearing. Please give whatever comes to your hand to your servants and to your son, David. So we have David now appearing and, or not appearing, but through his emissaries appearing 
and greeting this man who is evidently doing well, kind of congratulating him on the happy circumstances of his life, reminding him that all the time that he was out there with his livestock kind of in a vulnerable situation, there was not any harm that came, but strategically, the actual term that's used here in Hebrew is we didn't, we didn't embarrass them. It's the idea of protecting them and giving them a kind of dignity in the setting in which they found themselves. So, for services rendered, David asking what we might call protection money, although in a more positive sense than that term is often used. He says, you can confirm my story by asking your young men. They would certainly agree that that was what took place. And David concludes this little presentation in a very humble sort of way as an appeal from your son, your son David, to Nabal. So David's young men came. They spoke to Nabal according to those words. They waited. The sense of the word waited as they sat down. They were expecting something. How much was perfectly within the discretion of Nabal. The worst that they thought might happen was he would just dust them off or only give them a little token. They weren't giving him a bill. They weren't saying, here's how much you owe us. They were just waiting for, as I say, kind of a gratuity. They probably weren't quite uh, expecting the response they actually got. Nabal responds and answered David's servants as following. Who's David? Who's the son of Jesse? You know, nowadays there's many servants who break away each one from his master. Should I take my bread and water and meat that I've killed for my own shearers and give them to people I don't even know where they're from? Well, who is David? It's an insult. Uh, it's not as if Nabal didn't know who David was or you know, the, the, the most, one of the most famous men in Israel. His reputation was well known, but you almost get the feeling that the message here is this nobody surrounded by a bunch of other renegade nobodies, people that don't deserve any respect from an important descendant of Caleb like me, or should I say like I, which is it? I, thank you. So thank you, like I am. There you are, perfect. So this is the response, an insult. Insults were considered almost a worse injury then than breaking a bone. This was, this was a slap in the face in the most egregious sort of way. Now it's doubtful that Nabal would have been quite so rude had David actually been standing there because he's known as quite the warrior and a man who is a force to be reckoned with, but David wasn't around at the moment and Nabal is feeling pretty full of himself and so he gives this retort, this casual dismissal as if he's dealing with riffraff and doesn't really need to take them very seriously at all. He's not going to offer them, he says, bread and water. That would be the common colloquialism for meat and wine. Uh, bread and water would be common enough, but this would be something a little better, and that's actually the way it's rendered in the Septuagint version. All right, well, there's two sides to this. One commentator said, you can kind of see it from Nabal's point of view. His actions were understandable, as there were protection rackets around then as now. And he might also have feared reprisals from Saul. He probably knew about 85 priests who had been put to the sword because of allegedly helping David. And so you can at least imagine that Nabal is a little bit cautious about extending help to this rather controversial character, David. So if we see this in the light most favorable to Nabal, we can at least give him a little bit of breathing room for this report. However, this commentator continues, on the other hand, Abigail sees deeper into the situation and recognizes that David is blessed by God, is no ordinary bandit, and that the smart money should be placed on him. So we have two perspectives. Nabal is a little over the top in his reaction, but we at least can see arguably that he would 
uh, to have such a response. Abigail, on the other hand, seems to, be, seems to be able to assess this more clearly. Well, David's young men don't argue the point. They turned on their heels, went back. They came and told David all these words. Then David said to his men, well, guys, you know, we're supposed to love our enemies. We do good to those that treat us despicably. We'll pray for his soul. Oh, I, I, no, right. <laughs> uh, so uh, David said to his men, okay, guys, soldier up. Put on your swords. And they all obeyed. Then David girded his own sword. And about 400 men went with David. 200 stayed behind to guard the supplies. You have to say, this is now David, not the cool head, but the hot head, you know? This is not the response of the man after God's own heart that we've kind of gotten used to seeing. This is more a response of someone who has a violent streak, who can be given to anger in a flash, who is acting at this point a bit more like an outlaw or a gangster than someone who would uh, ultimately become one of the most famous men celebrated for his virtue in all the Old Testament. So here they go. Meantime, back at the ranch, the young men told Abigail. One of the young men goes to Nabal's wife and says, now look, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master and he reviled them. But the men were very good to us. And we were not hurt, we didn't miss anything as long as we accompanied them when we were in the fields. They were a wall to us, both night and day, all the time we were with them keeping the sheep. Now, I'm telling you, think about what David could do. I think harm is probably determined against our master and against all of us because that Nabal husband of yours is such a scoundrel no one can speak peaceably to him so there's a little inside information delivered to Abigail this was a man who apparently was a witness of the whole thing he was obviously out there with these sheep with the herds the livestock He'd probably formed some friendship with a couple of these guys that were acting on behalf of David. He knew that they were acting in a way that was certainly to the benefit of the shepherds there and to Nabal himself. Now he probably witnesses what took place here. He might have even seen one of these guys that he was acquainted with who came among those who were sent by David. And so he has inside information. He indicates that the speech given by these men was, re, was uh, the response to it was that Nabal reviled them. The literal meaning of the word is flew on them, kind of like a bird of prey. It was this outrageous, over-the-top reaction that was way beyond anything that you could possibly imagine. Even if Nabal had said, oh, sorry, I'm a little short today, you know, uh, that would have been less offensive than what he actually did. This insulting response was the kind of thing that any person who had self-respect in that culture at that time could not simply allow it to pass. It was a kind of code of nobility, you might say. You don't take that sort of insult without responding to it in a way that is commensurate with the insult that's just been delivered. And so it was almost calculate, it was almost predictable that David would respond in some way that could very well be violent. Whether it's justified or not is a different question, but certainly in the culture of the day, it would became, became highly predictable that that would be the outcome. The interesting thing, and he spins the irony here just perfectly, he's saying, we were not put to shame by David. He could have. He had the firepower. He could have embarrassed us. We were the vulnerable ones. We had no position to defend, but he, they treated us with respect. They treated us like we had special uh, value and so on, and now what, uh, what does your husband do? He turns around and gives exactly the opposite to these guys. Just making the 
crime even more egregious given the fact that David had treated them so well. David had provided a wall of protection from Philistine raiding parties, Amalekites, wild beasts, and others. And finally, with this rather powerful concluding comment, your husband is such a son of Belial. That was a common epithet for a man that is a worthless, bad person. And so that's what Abigail hears, and she doesn't argue the point, you'll notice. Well, Abigail made haste, took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five sheep already dressed, five seahs of roasted grain, 100 clusters of raisins, 200 cakes of figs, loaded them on donkeys, said to her servants, you go before me, I'm coming behind you. She didn't mention to her husband Nabal what was going on. And so it was, as she rode on the donkey, that she went down under cover of the hill, and there were David and his men coming toward her down a shallow ravine, I assume, into the area there in the middle. Uh, most of that uh, is self, the grocery list there is self-explanatory. Five sias, if you're not familiar with that, would amount to about 10 gallons of roasted grain. That was considered a delicacy. The raisin cakes were also kind of a delicacy. This, this was a pretty substantial gift, probably more than they were expecting. So she's going over the top, you see, to do what she can now to try to uh, settle things down, at least in terms of this gift that she's put together. They meet this phrase, under cover of the hill, means kind of in a shallow valley or ravine, as we said. Well, David, on, at the same time, is approaching from the other way, and he's doing the kind of typical self-talk. Have you ever done this? I kind of guess he's doing this under his breath, but the people closest to him can overhear it. <laughs> oh, in vain I protected this fellow. <laughs> Nothing was missed of all that he had. And he's repaid me evil for I'm, In other words, I tell you, may God do so and more also to the enemies of David if I leave one man alive by morning light. And you know how we do this? We know we're on a mission that is not quite justifiable. We know that at our better moments, this is not exactly what we'd be proud of later, but we're just kind of full of a head of steam, and you know how you kind of talk to yourself? Well, this person, I'll tell you, we play the tape over and over, and you know, they deserve this, and I'm... And you can kind of see it, can't you? This is David. And he's kind of riling up the men who are with them, getting them to join him in this rather malevolent attitude. So David is justifying his anger, and yet even now you get a little hint that he knows he's on a bit of thin ice. It's a very subtle point, but notice the epithet, the curse that David gives here, which is kind of a standard formula you'll run into in the Old Testament. May God do so and more also to the enemies of David if I leave one male of all those uh, who belong to him. Well, the normal way that's stated is may God do so and more to David, you know. Already David's feeling a little superstitious about this deal, a little bit uneasy, and so he's wanting to deflect any curses that might be out there in this moment, but it's a subtle point, but I think you sense even David at this moment knows that this isn't really quite the trajectory he should be pursuing. Now, when Abigail saw David, she dismounted quickly from the donkey, fell on her face before David, bowed down to the ground, displaying humility, but listen to me, she is now going to give the longest single recorded speech of any woman in the Bible, period. And what a speech. Norman Vincent Peale could not do better. This was a masterpiece of persuasion, of subtle pressure, and yet at the same time avoiding giving any offense. It is a model of how we can approach hard conversations. In fact, I was thinking we might write a book based on Abigail's speech. 
I'm not sure what to call it, but I think something like a soft approach to a hard conversation, something like that, might do. Well, here it goes. She fell at his feet and said, On me, my Lord, on me let this iniquity be, and please let your maidservant speak in your ears and hear the words of your maidservant. Please let not my Lord regard this scoundrel Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, folly is his game. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young man whom my Lord sent. What shall we call the first chapter of our book? I suggest acknowledging your own mistakes before criticizing the other person. We've all had to have con hard conversations. We've all had moments when we had to sit down and talk to someone, and it was not going to be necessarily an enjoyable moment, at least as we anticipated it. But one of the first things to do that Abigail certainly does is come in not blaming right off the bat, but owning her part, whatever it might be, and we know it's a pretty limited part, but she owns it fully as if she were responsible for more than actually she was taking some of the blame first to de defuse the situation. So on me, she says, taking full responsibility. Let the iniquity fall on me. That's a way of saying, punish me. Rather than smiting these others, you can smite me. That's what she's doing, putting herself in a quite vulnerable situation here. She refers to her husband as a son of Belial. We saw that earlier, a worthless guy. But you see, she's, in a sense, acting in on his behalf. She's owning responsibility for this jerk she's married to. Not distancing or excusing herself, but actually saying, you know, I'm responsible for this character. And so even here, she's owning something of the responsibility. She says she didn't know about the young men, but the implication is she should have. If I'd been paying attention, I would have seen this coming, you see. And so all, of, all this entire first little chapter of our book is Abigail finding a way to deflect the blame from others to herself. It's a remarkable thing. Then she continues, here's chapter two. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, since the Lord has held you back from coming to bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hand, now then, let your enemies and those who seek harm for my Lord be as Nabal. We're going to call this chapter, Acknowledge but Minimize the Mistakes of the Other Person. This is not sugarcoating, but have you ever noticed, I've, maybe I'm the only one, I probably am. You're all much better people, but you know, when I'm in a little conflict with someone, my first impulse is to totally excuse myself. This wasn't my fault. And then to exaggerate them, you always do that. You always say, you're, you're forever doing that. You know, and how, how many times do we hear that kind of thing? Just blowing way off, out of proportion, the fault of the other person. While at the same time, we look like, you know, you know just uh, coming out smelling like a rose. Well, how unreal is that? And here, Abigail does just the opposite. She overowns her own responsibility and just minimizes without ignoring the fault of David. So notice what she says, the Lord has held you back, as if to say, look, David, you haven't done anything wrong yet. Just because you're loaded for bear, just because you've got 400 guys who are about to you know, slaughter the whole household of Nabal and leave a bloodbath there, you really haven't done anything yet that's all that bad, it's okay. You know, and she kind of puts a lid on this thing. And then she says this, let your enemies be as Nabal, this is really just saying something like, you know, don't stoop to the level of your enemies. David, you're better than this. You're a better man than this. You, 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 it's a little bit of a tiny lapse here, but, but don't become like your enemies, like that idiot that I married to, Nabal. Don't become like him. You're better than that. So chapter two, acknowledge but minimize the mistakes of the other person. Chapter three, now let this present which your maidservant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your maidservant. 
Chapter 3, offer a reasonable solution to the misunderstanding. It always helps to come with a practical resolution of the problem, something that can be done. In this case, it's giving and accepting a gift. In the ancient world, to give and receive a gift became a foundation typically of an accord. You may recall that when Jacob was coming back from Padan Aram and was looking forward to meeting his brother Esau, who'd been angry with him for 20 years, Jacob prepares a gift. He begs his brother Esau to accept the gift because he knows if Esau will take the gift, an accord has been achieved. And that's what Abigail is wanting to do here. She also asks forgiveness. Even though we would say in the great scheme of things, it doesn't seem she has a whole lot to ask forgiveness for, the very fact of asking forgiveness for anything, any fault you have, does tend to defuse the situation as well. It, it, it don't do it as a manipulation, certainly, but a sincere request for forgiveness goes a long way in building up a little goodwill in a tough conversation. Abigail continues, the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house because my Lord fights the battles of the Lord and evil is not found in you throughout your days. Chapter four, point out that the other person is better than this. You're a better person than this. You are responsible for much more important good things in your history. You are an important valued person and you are doing important and valued work. It's true of all of us, and if we go into a hard conversation recognizing legitimately the truth of that in connection with the person that we're dealing with, it not only will help them see things a little bit more uh, clearly, but it'll help us see them a little more clearly as well. To see the good in the person with whom we ha may have this uh, difficult relationship can go a long way. Abigail says, a man has arisen to pursue you and seek your life. But the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God and the lives of your enemies he shall sling out as from the pocket of a sling. Abigail reminds David that, reminding the other person that the good effects, that good effects inevitably follow good actions. She is, in effect, reminding David that he has been hunted by Saul. This is the man she's referring to who's pursuing David without any justification. And David has conducted himself so virtuously in this, and that's well known in the country, that David is being falsely accused, hunted down, and yet he has been so much a man of dignity in this really outrageous and uh, unjustifiable attack on him. At this point, Nabal, for what he's done, as bad as it is, isn't even a fraction of what Saul has done. Saul was prepared to go out and just turn the man into a grease spot. Nabal, well, we can't really justify what he did, but please, not nearly as bad as Saul, and yet here's David reacting to Nabal infinitely worse than he did. Does he treat Saul with respect? It's the anointed of the Lord. How could I lay my hand against this? He's filled with that kind of dignity and respect for Saul. And now with Nabal, who's just this, you know, kind of uh, worthless character, a son of Belial, David is completely out of control. So Abigail wants to remind David the corollary of what David himself had said to Saul. David had said to Saul, wicked deeds flow from wicked people. You may remember that from last week. Well, in a sense, the corollary is as you do good deeds, you show you're a good person and God himself will acknowledge that in your life and in the consequences of it. So referring here to this man who has arisen, David's virtue has been protected from Saul, making a kind of subtle allusion to David slinging a stone and destroying Goliath. David has been slinging his enemies right and left because God has blessed him and David will continue to have that kind of career 
unless he lets this moment besmirch his reputation and become a lifelong black eye that he has to carry with him. So she concludes, and it shall come to pass when the Lord has done for my Lord according to all the good that he's spoken concerning you and has appointed you ruler over Israel, that this will be no grief to you nor offensive heart to my Lord, either that you have shed blood without cause or that my Lord has avenged himself, but when, you, when the Lord has dealt well with you, then remember your maidservant. So finally, remind the other of the most valued benefit of the proposal you're making, a clear conscience. It's nice to go through life with a clear conscience, and you wanna help this person with whom you have some tension maintain that very valuable benefit. So what is David going to do? You can imagine. He's seething, he's angry, he's, you know, holding his sword, he's got these men with him, they're all loaded for bear, ready to shed blood, and all of a sudden this woman comes. She falls down. David could have just brushed her aside, get out of my way, woman, it wouldn't have been the least bit unusual for the culture of the day, but he stops. She gives this speech. He stands there, maybe in stony silence. And then there's this pregnant pause when she's done. The men are wondering, fidgeting a bit, what's he gonna do, what's he gonna do? You can hear a pin drop in that little ravine as a few moments pass, and then David speaks. Blessed is the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. Blessed is your advice, blessed are you because you've kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and avenging myself with my own hand. If our book has a chapter seven, it's going to be make the other person happy at what you have suggested. That's what happens here. David says, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has kept me from hurting you, unless you would hurry and come to meet me, surely by morning light not a man would be left to Nabal. So David received from her hand what she had brought him and said to her, go in peace to your house. Look, I've heeded your voice. I've respected your person. Well, catastrophe averted. Abigail goes home, and there she finds her husband holding a feast in the house like the feast of a king. Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunk. Therefore she told him nothing, little or much, until morning light, a little hungover the next day, I suppose. So it was in the morning when the wine had gone from Nabal and his wife had told him these things that his heart died within him. He became like a stone. Then it happened after about 10 days that the Lord struck Nabal and he died. Nabal was drunk, but he was drunk on self-importance, on wealth, on power before he was drunk on wine. That was just the final little expression of an intoxicated view of life. Drinking, of course, in ancient Israel, drinking wine was taken for granted. That point I don't think needs to be seriously debated, but drunkenness was viewed with disdain. And certainly Nabal was a very bad example of the use of wine. We don't know what happened to him. Maybe it was a natural Result, apoplectic seizure, a stroke. Was this the direct judgment of God? It certainly was in the end, because we hear that the Lord struck him 10 days later, but one way or another, Nabal was at this point neutralized. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, blessed be the Lord who has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal and kept his servant from evil. For the Lord has returned the wickedness of Nabal on his own head, and David sent and proposed to Abigail to take her as his wife. David 
recognizes once again something he certainly had in mind earlier, that vengeance is the Lord's. I will repay. That's the promise of God unless we get in the way. So we are not to avenge ourselves. We are to believe that there's actually a God in heaven who worries about these things, and thus we don't need to. And at this point, the proof, once again, is in the evidence of the situation. He proposed to Abigail, probably moved both by her sensible conduct here, also by news that Michal, his first wife, had been given by her father Saul to another. And so at this point, David is technically single. It also seems to suggest that David has a rising sense of security about his situation, that he's willing to bring women into the circumstance to accompany them there in this wilderness experience. It may still strike us as a little odd that he, that he proposes to Abigail quite so suddenly. One commentator offers the following, the remarriage of the widow soon after the death of her first husband is common in the East, so that the proprieties were not violated by David's haste. It's easy to read contemporary standards into the story, but it must be borne in mind that women were not much more than chattel at the time, and most marriages were loveless and arranged, of which this was probably Exhibit A, the Nabal. Abigail was shrewd, insightful, and played the situation well, not knowing what the outcome would be, but knowing the outcome would most likely vindicate David. As it turns out, David gets Abigail, but loses Michal, who was given by Saul to another. When the servants of David had come to Abigail at Carmel, they spoke to her, saying, David has sent us to you to ask you to become his wife. Then she arose, bowed her face to the earth, and said, Here is your maidservant, a servant, to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. You couldn't possibly express a more humble response to that proposal. So Abigail rose in haste, rode on a donkey, attended by five of her maidens, and she followed the messengers of David and became his wife. Nabal was wealthy, but in the inheritance rules of the day, that didn't necessarily devolve to her. As I say, the status of women generally, especially at that time in history, was much less secure. And so even though she was married to a wealthy man, she wasn't necessarily coming out of his death with any degree of respectable wealth herself. And so she brings five who have been her attendants, and that's about it. And uh, she goes in response to this request and becomes the wife of David. Interestingly, we don't hear a whole lot about Abigail anymore. Obviously, the biblical history is fairly selective. We assume that she had some ongoing positive influence in David's career. We hear her mention, we hear something of her children, but that's about it. This is her moment of really having a very significant impact on the career of David. Then we scratch our heads a bit because the chapter ends, David also took Ahinoam of Jezreel, and so both of them were his wives. But Saul had given Michal, his daughter, David's wife, to Palti, the son of Laish, who was from Galim. So we have a second wife that enters the picture without any introduction whatsoever. It's reported to us neither with approval nor with sanction, which is often the case in the Old Testament. Uh, the Bible doesn't always comment on the actions of its players. It just reports them like Joe Friday, just the facts, ma'am. And in this case, uh, it's just the facts. So I'm going to leave it to your own assessment uh, how you want to judge that particular action on David's part. But it is worth noting that family squabbles were going to play an increasingly critical role in David's career. Why would any man want more than one wife? I don't get that. I don't understand it, you know. But anyway, you know in the ancient world that was quite common and was almost taken for granted. All right, I'll leave you with this. We are called to do good deeds as Christian people and as God's people have been all through history. But a truly good deed should be performed with no thought of repayment or even recognition. We know, of course, had David read the Sermon on the Mount, he would have been up to speed on this point. If you're going to do good deeds, that's good. If you're doing them for public approval, for notice, for acclaim, for compensation, for recognition, then that means already there's a little bit of fuzziness surrounding the motives 
that lie behind these good deeds. And so Jesus warns us, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. Do these deeds discreetly, preferably anonymously. What you do anonymously, what you do knowing only God sees it, means you're doing it truly in faith. If you really believe that only God sees the good deed you're doing, then it means you really do have faith that God is actually up there and noticing what you're doing, you see. And when we want to make sure somebody else saw it, it just means we don't quite have that confidence. We think God may be sleeping. We just may not be so sure. So a true good deed is done so under the radar, nobody knows about it except you and God. And Jesus' promise is that what the Father sees in secret, he will reward openly. So David needed to read that. Uh, I think maybe in the very first instance, he should have done what he did, but trusted God that God would repay him for his good deed rather than going and exacting payment, as it were, from Nabal. I'll leave that to your judgment, but that's kind of my thought about where this thing started going wrong. Second, we are warned not to keep score of wrongs, but to trust God, who is more concerned and more competent to keep score than we are. We have great scorecards in our heads, don't we? Is it, is it just me? I keep a pretty good score of the wrongs that have been done to me. I kind of lose track of the wrongs I've done to others. I don't know, those get lost somewhere. I also keep a pretty good score of the good things I've done for others. Well, I did this and this and this. I can list them off, you know, like that. God is a better scorekeeper than you are. We should do our good deeds and forget them. God will notice. David, of course, at this point, was not only keeping score of wrongs, but keeping score of good deeds. And he had a tally sheet, and it was off that that he was working at this point. And I think that got him a little further off track as the story unfolds. Finally, we are provided good counsel, sometimes from unlikely sources, and do well to listen for the voice of God in all who cross our path. Now, we listen to the voice of God in the Scriptures. The Word of God is the Word of God. But God can sometimes speak to us from unlikely sources. Sometimes it's a casual conversation at the checkout stand at the grocery store. Some it's can be on, and we're always called to be listening for the wisdom of God that may come from very unexpected places. I doubt that David was expecting the wife of the man he was about to murder to show up on his doorstep at this point but one of the most eloquent presentations in all the Bible came courtesy of this woman. So let's always be listening for the voice of God coming through unlikely sources that we may encounter along the way.